So on the podcast over the past two weeks, we've each revisited our favourite first Doctor story. Um, mine was the Aztecs, Liam's was the Crusade, and today we start our second Doctor stories, and mine is the Tomb of the Cyberman. <laughs> Hello listeners and hello Liam. Hi Rob, how's it going? Not bad, thanks. Have you been up to much? Um, any watching lately? Um, well, I have been watching a little bit of Doctor Who, not just in terms of Tomb of the Cybermen, because I got the season 14 Blu-ray box set which came out um, time of recording a couple of weeks ago now. Um, oh. So I've just been slowly going through some of, the, some of the stories. So I'm up to The Robots of Death. Um, so I've watched the first two episodes of that. Uh, I'm still going through my Columbo uh, binge watch. Uh, I was going to ask you about that the other day. Yeah, I'm still enjoying that. Uh, I've got one more episode until I finish the third series. Um, mm. But other than that, I haven't really... So, so I think my television... Although um, I did buy the Blu-ray box set of the classic Universal horror films. So I've watched Dracula from 1931. Um, right. Okay. Uh, which I quite enjoyed. Um, so at some point I'll watch Frankenstein next, um, which I have seen before, of course, but it's been many, many years. Uh, I think that's, oh yeah, and watching Futurama now and again, I think that's been it, really. How about you? Have you been watching anything? No, um, I watched The Tomb of the Cybermen, surprise, surprise. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. apart, apart from that, what have I watched? Oh yes, um, I watched Ocean's Eleven for the first ever time last night. Ah, oh, really? What did you think? I liked it. Um, I thought, oh, it looks it. I'm sure everyone loves it, but I didn't. I wasn't in the mood for it. I thought maybe a bit boring, but I really liked it. So mm-hmm. maybe watch the next one tomorrow. See, because I've seen Ocean's Eleven. I haven't seen any of the others. So mm. if you if you rec- if you watch Ocean's Twelve and say it's any good, uh, I might might get around to watching it. Yeah, I'll definitely have a watch tomorrow. I think. Um. But no, that's about it for me. Um, so how many movies are in the Universal Collection? That's a good question. It has Dracula, Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Invisible Man, The Bride of Frankenstein, The Wolf Man, Phantom of the Opera, and of course, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Excellent. Yeah. I was wondering if it had a lot more, like lots of oddball, kind of... Yeah, uh, no, I think they've just stuck with the good ones. Just, yeah. <laughs> Because um, I'm sure you're aware to some extent of the the Tom Cruise mummy a few years back. That was going to be the start of a, a shared universe, the dark universe. <laughs> yes, which actually I thought was quite a good idea. Um, but I saw the trailer of the movie and... Was like, mm. Did you see the, the very first trailer that they put out and they forgot to put the sound on it? <laughs> No, if I you look it up, it, there's a scene where they, I don't know, they're all tumbling around in the aeroplane, uh-huh. and there's it, there's no there's no sound effects, but then occasionally you hear the dubbed in like oh 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 as they're getting <laughs> bashed around. <laughs> oh, I need to watch that. That sounds fantastic. It was, uh, uh, it, but Universal published the wrong trailer, the incomplete trailer. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, it's really hilarious. Check yeah, it out. the side of things to come, perhaps. No, because I saw the uh, the trailer, the completed one. And it was the movie to end the franchise. It was the first movie. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> but I thought that was the problem. I think they... I mean, I can see why they would want to, to do... Um, uh, to sort of set up that universe. But I think yeah. rather than... From what I can understand, because I haven't seen the movie yet, because I saw I saw the trailer, I thought, uh, I'm, I'm not really judging off that. I'm not that fussed to go to the cinema and watch it. If I do, I'll probably happy be in the house um but yeah i think from what i can understand um the whole movie was trying was just there to set up the universe and not really tell a good story that's a shame yeah Um, but but i might watch it i might watch it at some point but yeah it's uh it is a bit (laughs) 
it is sort of darkly comic saying uh, it was to set up everything, but it, yeah, it's, it just didn't happen. Obviously, copying the copying the the popular formula that Marvel's using, mm-hmm. which is a good thing. I like a, I like a good shared universe. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, the uh, cinema has become massively saturated with it. It is uh, mm-hmm. it is a bit much, I think. But uh, mm-hmm. but anyway, yeah. And uh, another mm-hmm. news, because uh, did a food shop not all that long ago, and uh, I quite like Marmite. Uh, you know, I think it's it's all right. Uh, I know some people like really, really on 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 the fence. I thought it was like either two polar extremes love it or hate it well no but what you, I... quite, you, you quite like it yeah I quite, I quite like it so quite I'm, a unique perspective it is yes uh, I quite like it but no what I mean by that is I like it but I know that you know people who, who say that they like it they seem to really love it where they I know that um, some people say that they love it that much they could easily eat a jar of it all in one go and I just think oh god that's a bit much because it's a very strong taste and I'm like one slice of toast with it fine anything more than that i think is a bit much but um mm. i thought well i've always been curious about vegemite uh and you know there's this whole thing about you know which is better marmite or vegemite and uh and because vegemite's australian they've made it since 1923 i think um okay the australians are all about vegemite's clearly the best so you know what i went oh i'll give it a go and what happened so, so I did this this taste comparison thing. Had a bit of uh, marmite. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with that. Right, let's see Vegemite. Expecting them to taste basically the same because they're both you know, these yeast extract type things. No, they taste, I think, completely different. And uh, I came to a conclusion of which one yeah. I think is better. And oh. what I thought I'd do was uh, I'll, I'll I'll tweet what I thought. And I'll let Janet Fielding know <laughs> okay. what I thought. Because I think a few days ago, uh, she she happened to have some tweets about Vegemite or something like that. So I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll put in my pennies worth. And uh, I'll let her know that I actually think that Vegemite's better. Because okay. uh, I, I just think, one, it's, uh, it's much more easier to spread. See, the problem is with Marmite, uh, I mean, I know that you can use it in other things, like, you, you know, if you put it in gravy and so on but in terms of a spread it's it, it it's useless it just dribbles around all over the place whereas with Vegemite it's a proper spread you can spread it but I also think uh, the taste is a lot better anyway I, I let Janet Fielding know this and she's then tweeted the entire world that the, the matter is closed and it's official because I said so um, that Vegemite's better so it's official I've I, according to Janet Fielding I have closed wow. the argument that of which is better? It's Vegemite. It's official. So you've ended. You've ended the argument. I've ended the argument. Yep. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Changed the world. <laughs> we could all move on to important conversations. <laughs> Excellent. But then there's the age-old question: Is Marmite good or bad? <laughs> so. <laughs> I mean, it's it is one of those things. It's a yeah. Uh, it's a very unique taste. Um, yes. And it is very strong. I can understand why you know if people don't like it. Yeah, you've won a short battle, but wars will be fought over Marmite for years to come. <laughs> yeah, but everyone just but when everyone should just stick with Vegemite, and it'll be perfectly simple. But anyway. Um. So what's new with the podcast? What's new? Um. There is something new, Liam. Uh, we now have an email newsletter. Ah interesting mm. uh, so if you go on the website you can click list and subscribe enter your email put your name in if you want and you'll get weekly updates of all the goings on on the website oh that's fantastic that'd be quite good hopefully yeah. we'll get some takers good way good way to keep in touch because mm-hmm. um, it is a bit confusing there's so many ways to subscribe to a podcast there's there's audio RSS feeds. There's a website RSS feed that you could subscribe to a particular podcast provider, um, or you could follow them, follow the podcast on social media. There's there's no there's no single clear way to to follow a podcast, is there? So um, yeah, that's true. Actually, yeah. another another option there. No, no, that's a, that's a good idea, and hopefully, make things a, a lot more simpler for people who like the podcast. No, that's good. Yeah. Um, quizzes on the website uh, we've done one so far do you think Ooh, it's worth doing a few more 
I think so. Because uh, you, cause you, Rob, you actually did uh, the quiz. And I, I, I didn't know what the questions were. Um, you just said you were going to do it, and I did it, and I found it tremendous fun. Um, yeah. So, um, on that basis alone, I think you should do it. And I'm so pleased uh, that that I got full marks, considering yes. it was on the Aztecs, which we had just discussed. <laughs> yeah, I'm never sure how easy or hard to make it, and also how easy or hard will people find it. So it's a hard one to figure out. And when I did make the quiz. I just made it for fun. I didn't know I was going to publish it live. Mm-hmm. I thought, oh, this will be a test one and we'll make a, a bigger one. But then I realized that um, was it yesterday or the day before, it was the anniversary of the Aztecs. So I thought, oh, I'll add a few more questions and I'll just make it public. Mm-hmm. No, no that, was a, that was a good idea. And I, I, as I say, I like the questions. I also liked some of, because um, it's multi-choice, and I quite liked some of the, um, some of the you know, possible answers that you put. Um, one or two did make me chuckle. Um, don't tell the listeners. They need to go on the website and find out for themselves and tell us what score they get. Yeah. Write it in the comments below. So I think that's that's all for what's new this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, a, a quick plug for the website. Head to cloisterbell.co.uk for any updates. We're on social media. We'll give those handles out at the end. We should just do a bit of subliminal messaging, shouldn't we, through the podcast? Yeah. <laughs> Rate us on iTunes. Five stars. <laughs> or my all-time favourite, if you can hear this, you are dying. <laughs> oh, that's creepy. Let's do it. <laughs> um, so anyway, on to the Tomb of the Cyberman. Here's some quick tomb facts. Um, it is the first story in season five. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, it's a four part story. In fact, it's the only story of season five that does not consist of consist of six parts. Uh, it was broadcast between the second and twenty third of September, nineteen sixty seven. Um, it's set between Evil of the Daleks and the Abominable Abominable Snowman. Mm-hmm. Um, it was once considered to be a lost story. I think it was possibly from late 70s um, until late 1991 when the 16mm film telerecordings of all four episodes were returned to the BBC um, by a Hong Kong television company. And I know it was a big deal back then. I think there's probably a, a, a whole feature on the DVD about the Tomb Watch um, that you can go and check out. Um, but yes, it was quite a big deal when it was found, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was huge, and so it was. Uh, so as you said, it'd been um, discovered in Hong Kong, which took everyone by surprise. No one expect, uh, no one expected that. And then it was sort of rush released. It was released uh, on VHS in 1992, um, and it it was massively popular. It um, it shot up the charts. In fact, the f- uh, the week it was uh, the week it was released, I, I read this somewhere recently um the week it was released it sold more than the silence of the lambs vhs oh the vhs oh mm. really oh. which is quite impressive considering you know that was a uh, a very popular oscar winning film um that had just come out but uh tomb of the Cyberman proved to be more popular than silence of the lambs uh, i'm gonna put a, put a quick poll on twitter um which is better or which is scarier do you think out of Tomb of the Cybermen of Sounds mm. of the Lambs. We'll put them up for a battle on Twitter and we'll find out the results oh, at the end. New poll. Uh, which is better? Which is scarier? Which is your favourite? Uh, hmm. I don't think which is scarier because I think... Um, mm. I think... <laughs> I think probably which is your favourite? Which 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 is scarier to you? Ooh. Um... <laughs> Silence of the Lambs, I think. People who follow the Twitter until they listen to this podcast are going to be, why the hell is he asking that? That's so random. So, on to the plot. The TARDIS arrives on the planet Telos. Um, I think I read somewhere to the, the 25th century. Do you think that's right? Uh, Yeah, sounds about right. Where an Earth archaeological expedition led by Professor Parry is trying to uncover the lost tombs of the Cybermen. With a lot of help from the Doctor... The archaeologists enter the tombs. There, 
one of the party, Klieg, reveals himself and his business partner, Krafton, to be planning to re revive the Cybermen. He wants to use their strength, allied with the intelligence of his own Brotherhood of Logicians, to create an invincible force for conquest. It transpires, however, that the tomb is actually a giant trap designed to lure humans suitable for conversion into Cybermen, a fate that almost befalls Krafton's assistant Toberman. After fending off an attack by Cybermats, small but dangerous cybernetic creatures, the Doctor destroys the controller, defeats the revived Cybermen, and reseals the tombs. So that's the whole plot. And so on to the cast and crew, Doctor Who, of course, Patrick Troughton, Jamie McCrimmon, Fraser Hines, Victoria Waterfield, Deborah Walton, Toberman, Roy Stewart, Professor Parry, Aubrey Richards, John Viner, Cyril Shapps, Jim Callum, Clive Merrison, Crafton, Shirley Cooklin, real life wife of producer Peter Bryant, Captain Hopper, George Rubick, Eric Kleeg, George Pastel, Ted Rogers, Alan Johns, Peter Hayden, Bernard Holly, Crewman, Ray Grover, Cyberman Controller, Michael Kilgariff, and of course, Cyberman Voices, Peter Hawkins. Produced by Peter Bryant, his first producing role on Doctor Who, I believe. Um, written by Kit Pedler and Jerry Davis, both co-creators of the Cybermen having collaborated on the 10th planet together. Directed by Morris Barry, who had directed another Cyberman story, The Moonbase, earlier that year. Mm -hmm, that's right, yeah. And in fact, he would later go on to direct... Um... The Dominators, which is another Patrick Troughton story, and has the distinctive honour, I think, of being the most boring Doctor Who story ever. Um, later on, he actually uh, became a, a little bit of an actor, and he had a, a minor role in the Tom Baker story, The Creature from the Pit. As well as other things, Blake 7? Yes, uh, second series, an episode called Killer, if I remember rightly. Mm. Which is quite a good episode. Um, there's a bit of a Blake 7 connection in this episode. To me. Oh, okay, go on. <laughs> the the entrance to the tomb mm -hmm. is like a circle with like a, a pointy arrow on it, and it looks like the um, the Blake Seven. Symbol. Oh yes, you're right. I'd never clocked that before. Uh, but yeah, it does look. Yeah, I think it's. it's I think they ripped off the Tomb of the Cybermen. Well, actually, so, cause some people think that um, the symbol is a rip off from Star Trek because the the Star Trek symbol. The Blake 7 look was just... They've just rotated it onto the side. So some people think that it's a, it's sort of like a rip-off of Star Trek. Yeah, I see that a lot, but I don't, um, <laughs> uh, don't agree with that. <laughs> it's a bit of a leap. They've rotated it and they've changed its shape. <laughs> it's no longer, no longer curved. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, Tomb of the Cybermen, Episode 1. We have a great shot entering the TARDIS. We, we actually go through the doors... Mm -hmm with Victoria which is a very cool shot yeah because uh, in the, the the early moments of episode one a lot of it is uh, shot on film um, the first I would say probably the first five minutes uh, and it really uh, lends a tremendous atmosphere um, to, to the story um, with Talos when we arrive there it's atmospheric but this uh, initial TARDIS scene is, is really lovely because we just had as you said before uh, the previous story was the evil of the Daleks, which introduced Victoria to the series uh, for the first time. So now, really, she's a fully fledged companion now. Uh, so she's entering yeah. um, the the TARDIS for the first time. Although, surely she would have. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how they arrived on Scara actually. If it was the, anyway, uh, it's it's a really nice scene. Although I do need to grow up because uh, there is a there is a line which makes me chuckle. What are all those knobs? Um, there's, a, there's there is another thing before that. She says, "I can't believe it. It's so big." <laughs> hey, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a. <laughs> what are all those knobs? But um, this must have sounded so weird on audio. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, because you know that um, you know Orbital, and they did a uh, they did a, sort of like a dance version of the Doctor Who theme. Um, no. Oh, well. Uh, maybe I maybe I do. I, th I think you would have heard it because uh, it was quite popular. In fact. Uh, Orbital performed it in Glastonbury when Matt Smith was playing the Doctor, and Matt Smith actually appeared on stage with them, um, right, to to help them perform the Doctor Who theme. 
Uh, so mm. you, you may have actually heard it, but anyway, sometime in the late nineties, they did a sort of like a dance version of it. And whenever they um, performed it live on stage, they actually had sound a sound clip. And it was this it was this introduction of Tomb of the Cybermen that they used. They used the audio of Deborah Watman going, um, "What are all those mobs?" And then Tom Baker, uh, uh, not Tom Baker, sorry, Patrick Troughton, uh, you know his line. Oh, we're able to travel anywhere in time and space. This is my home. And then they would go into uh, the Doctor Who theme. So I thought you were going to say it's just Deborah Walton's line. <laughs> yeah, no, because I, th- I, uh, I thought it was initially, but then I remembered, no, it actually isn't. You do hear a little bit of Patrick Troughton as well. It would have been quite funny though, if it just did. <laughs> yeah. What are all these knobs? <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. The hell's this? Um, the doctor tells Victoria that of the TARDIS, he's perfected a rather special model. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure what he's implying here, whether he's implying he built the TARDIS or not, which I know is not the case now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think in those early stages, it was so, because when you go to the William Hartnell era, that, I mean, it's Susan who actually names the TARDIS. Um, mm-hmm. So I think initially it was sort of on the understanding, maybe they made it. Uh, mm-hmm. I suppose you could actually argue that what he did was because he, you know, if you want to try and tie tie this into co- uh, the continuity as we know it now, because um, he, he stole the Type 40, uh, which was a redundant type, and maybe he's perfected it a little bit to make it work properly. So Yeah, I'll definitely take it that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, when the Doctor tells her that he's a time traveller, um, she replies with... Um, if what you say is true, you must be how old? Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I don't quite know what she means, relatively speaking. Um, but the doctor replies with saying, he thinks about it for a moment, and he says he's about 450 years old. Now, depending on what Victoria meant, um, I'm not sure if what he's saying is literal, but um, I think since then we've took it as his literal age. Um, but I, I didn't quite get her meaning. No, I, I didn't either. Um, it's a bit lost in the writing or the performance. Possibly, unless we're meant to... Inv- maybe we're supposed to infer the fact that, well, if he built the time machine, that that will take an awful lot of time. Or maybe uh, maybe hmm. because you're flitting through. I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't quite make sense. Uh, maybe you're supposed to infer something. So I've always been a bit perplexed by that. Um, I think the line of... The doc, you know, the doctor saying, "Well, in Earth terms, mm-hmm. I must be about four hundred. Yes, about four hundred and fifty years old." Um, I think that is quite a good line, and Patrick Troughton delivers it quite nicely, and it's it's quite charming actually, you know, because you see, because even Jamie's surprised at that, and then yes. he goes, "Well, quite," and he's sort of a bit sheepish about it. But it's quite a nice scene, and you know, very humorous, um, mm-hmm. especially the way it ends because. Um, Victoria still, because she's from the Victorian era, and she's still dressed in, um, you know, a corseted dress. So the Doctor says, you know, sh- Jamie, show her to the wardrobe so she can wear something a bit more practical. And then Jamie says, you know, try and make a smooth landing. We don't want to scare her. The Doctor, you know, this sort of t- a smooth landing. What a nerve! Um, I love, I love that, and I love Patrick Troughton's performance of it. It's great, and it did make me laugh. But it was, it was, it's quite a nice, yes. charming introduction to the episode. Thank God the humour's in this episode. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. So we arrive on the planet Telos. We're, we're introduced to an expedition team of archaeologists. Mm-hmm. Um, Toberman's walking around the quarry above, recklessly. <laughs> yeah. um, and they set the explosives and reveal the doors of the cyber tomb. Um, they also give a round of applause. <laughs> Yay! Yay! So a nice, uh... great find. <laughs> Which is great, don't you think? A, a bunch of archaeologists trying to find something by using explosives. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Makes you want to become an archaeologist, doesn't it? That's all you do, go around blowing things up. Uh, they uncover the door perfectly as well. <laughs> perfectly excavated. <laughs> well, they know what they're doing then, so they're, you know, they're quite good. Yeah. <laughs> Advanced explosives. Yeah. It's the 25th century, Lane. <laughs> Yeah, true. Uh, archaeological techniques have obviously advanced quite considerably. So, yeah. Um, so they approach the tomb doors and there's some very fearsome looking Cybermen motifs on the wall. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, 
I don't know what you think of them. It looks like they had a date to design them and <laughs> make them out of tin foil. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I think the uh, the set designs, uh, which include these sort of motif motifs, is uh, is quite good. I do like the design in this episode. I mean, it, it does make you question what, why why the Cybermen so on brand? Because everywhere you go, there's yeah. the, there's, con- there's loads of Cybermen uh, images. Um, mm. But I actually think what it's I think what it's supposed to instill is a sort of um, a reference to Egyptology. You know, uh, the, the, the you know because we're entering a tomb like you would a pyramid, and I suppose you know there's some 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 reference to that in the story. And I suppose, you know, th- these motifs are the Cyberman's equivalent of hi- hieroglyphics. And I think I think it's one of those things which is just to drive home. This is a... This is... A, um, an expedition. A historical expedition. Like discover, uh, discovering pyramids and so on. And tombs and pyramids. But we're doing this, like, a, a futuristic version of it. Yeah, it's very cool. Why are they obsessed with this image of themselves? Is it is it vanity or is it trying to invoke fear or are these motifs outside the tomb because the whole tomb is actually a lure? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if if you're coming from the point of view that uh, Cybermen are completely emotionless, then it couldn't be vanity or anything like that. So yeah, I think it, you know from a logical point of view, I think the Cybermen are going well to to really drum at home. This is where we are. Let's slap up lots of images so there's no confusion. Um, yeah. Um, Crafton offers fifty pound to the first man mm-hmm. to open the doors. Um, do you think the fifty pound is quite a lot of money in the twenty fifth century? When this was broadcast in nineteen sixty seven, I think fifty quid, you know, wasn't something to be sniffed at. Having said that, though, I mean, for the sake of opening a door, if someone offered you fifty quid to open a door, um, you'd go fifty quid to open a door. Yeah, I'll do that. But uh, but just on that point, because uh, the Bank of England's inflation ca- uh, calculator says that £50 in 1967 is the equivalent now of £914.37. So essentially mm. she's offered £914 for anyone who can open the door. God, she, she, she could have made it a, a, a clean grand. <laughs> no, God. Big spender. <laughs> well, if you had a song coming on. So yes, that young lad leaps to the chance, but unfortunately he gets fried. Yeah, because the uh, the door's electrocuted. And then they hear the TARDIS mm-hmm. arrive. And the pilot goes to investigate. So the Doctor's coming. So they meet the Doctor, Jamie and Victoria. And of course the expedition is um, surprised mm-hmm. to see them. Of course, why would anybody else be here? And the wonders, who are they? And could they be a rival expedition? It sounds like the most plausible uh, mm-hmm. reason. Yeah, yeah. It. Um. The doctor examines the man who died, deducing that um, he's been electrocuted. So Professor Paris explains to him that they've come searching for the Cybermen and that Telos was their home. So it gently retcons um, Mondas. So now that the Cybermen have got this, this new home, um, we do know that chronologically this comes after um, the 10th planet and the moon base. Yes, that's right. Because uh, what the cyber controller says to the mm-hmm. doctor. It's also interesting that yeah. because it's said that I think this is five hundred years after the events of the moon base. Um, so f- five hundred years have right, passed, okay. and it's sort of interesting that everyone was aware of the Cybermen and the Cyber Wars, but no one knows what the Cybermen actually look like. So there's there's a, there's a gap in historical knowledge. So it could be explained that the fact that they that they believe Telos to be the Cybermen's home planet is actually incorrect. It could just be the case that the Cybermen have just used it um, rather than it being their home planet. I think um, I think Attack of the Cybermen, which is the Colin Baker story, I think probably tie, tries to tie in Mondas and Telos and explains that. I dare say Big Finish have, have tapped into it as well. The Doctor seems surprised when they mentioned the Cybermen and seems now compelled to stay. Um, but how did he not notice the big picture images on the wall? No, that's true. But I think I think at the same time, you know, he's just arrived <laughs> and he's aware that a man has just been killed. 
and it's sort of inferred that he may have something to do with it. So I, I think I know what you mean because it is one of those things of how could you possibly miss all that? Um, unless, unless his reaction was just pure sarcasm. <laughs> yeah, true. But uh, I think what? <laughs> there is that possibility as well. You don't <laughs> say. <laughs> Duh. But um, I think if you take it as red, I think, well, you know, he's just been confronted by a dead man who's clearly just been electrocuted. And I don't know about you, Rob, but sometimes I've walked around, you know, now and again, and I've missed something which has been staring me right in the face. God, how the hell have I missed that? So, Fair enough. <laughs> so the Doctor proceeds to open the doors. Of course, um, it's beyond his chance. But he doesn't give it much of a shot, does he? He's like, nope, can I do it? <laughs> if you watch carefully, um, I, th- I think it's handled quite well, because uh, I didn't notice it the first time I watched The Tomb of the Seven Moon, but the second time I watched it... I can see that what Patrick Troughton has done is um, you see him tugging at the doors, but actually he's placed his foot at the bottom of the st- sort of like rest so it doesn't open. Yeah, oh, yeah. Really? And then, uh, obviously, um, Fraser Hines, Jamie, because he attempts to do it, uh, does the same thing. But you know, it's it, it's it's done quite ah, well. It, but on first notice, I didn't, first viewing, I didn't uh, didn't notice it. But every time I watch it, I'm like, I can see where your feet are. So yes, the Doctor suggests Toberman opens mm-hmm. the tomb. They all enter cautiously, and the Doctor and Jamie enter hand in hand, which is a great scene. Yes, so it's, it's a it's a lovely uh, comic moment. And in fact, apparently, because uh, the director Morris Barry was someone who was very particular and very sort of fussy and had his own way. So uh, Patrick Trout and Fraser Hines had come up with this idea to do that scene, where they jokingly grab each other's hands and then go, "Oh, what we're doing?" And I thought you, I thought, I thought it was Victoria's <laughs> hand. And then go and see Victoria. So actually what they did was they didn't rehearse it. They just said, right, this is what we're going to do. And then when it came to recording, because in those days, um, pretty much everything was recorded as live. There was, you know, to stop a recording was quite expensive and so on. So they just did it, knowing that mm-hmm. it was going to remain. And I'm so pleased they did, because it is a just a nice little comic moment. <laughs> and, and and they do yes. it so well. It's, it's lovely and it is, it is funny. And then... You know, um, you know, Victoria's feeling a bit semi-conscious because she's a Victorian and she's no longer wearing this big Victorian dress. She's wearing something which, you know, reveals her legs. Um, you know, she's wearing basically a, a dress from the 60s. So she's been feeling very self-conscious. And I love the Doctor's line of going, um, uh, oh, don't worry about that. Look at Jamie's because he wears a kilt. And, uh, and then just goes, hey, hey. Oh, I. <laughs> It's great, it cracks me up, it's lovely. So you can start to see that Kraft and Eric Cleek, they're starting to strategize mm-hmm. that plan. Because doesn't um Kraft and say she tries to suggest um kind of who stays around and who who we need to keep an eye out for. Um so it's obvious at this stage that they're up to something. Yeah, the the they're a shifty pair. I love them as characters though, Captain and Eric Cleek. Shirley uh Cooklin and George uh Pastel who plays them. Oh, they're brilliant. Um, just the way that they, they play it really well. It's it's not hammy at all, but they just exu- they just exude uh, you know, sort of like uh, evil, but in quite a quite a nice uh, captivating way. And I love Shirley Cookland's performance as Kaftan. It's just fantastic. And there's there's just I've forgotten which episode it is, but there's just a, she says a line and she and she goes, A, Eric. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's just the way she says it. It's just, A, Eric. <laughs> we need more villains called Eric. So I don't have that line written in. Eric Klee. <laughs> A, Eric. <laughs> just cracks me up. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> so um, Professor Parry rounds up the team and he points out that this room is a dead end. And the only way out is through the hatch. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I think the Doctor's improved his observational skills now. Because he then points out, however, that there are two doors either side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for for archaeologists. <laughs> you know, just, just like... Uh, oh, yeah, there's that big obvious thing in the corner. <laughs> but again, it's great. It's just like... Uh, just the way that the Doctor just goes, yes, apart from the other two doors... Which are the two doors? Well, that one there and that one over there. Um, it's just... Just great. It's delightful. But it shows that, you know, um, 
the doctor's really on the ball at this point and mm-hmm. um in fact it's not long after um because this episode it's 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 nothing it's nothing too fancy it's just there's a brilliant line which i love because i just think it's a good line uh but it's i think it's more to do with how patrick Troughton delivers it um so there's all these logic puzzles that they have to solve in order to open the doors and then open the hatch and then um the doctor demonstrates he knew the answer to one of the logic puzzles and then eric a eh, eric anyway eh, eric says um how do you know how did you know the answer and the doctor says oh, i just use my own special technique oh really doctor uh, may we know what that is i just goes by keeping my eyes open and my mouth shut yes yeah love it great um I love the the interaction between the two uh, between the two actors, uh, but Pat Trout just delivers that line superbly. It's great. Um, so Parry splits the group up into two, mm-hmm. um, but of course he says it's best if the women stay behind. <laughs> yeah, um, I think this is one aspect of the story which doesn't date particularly well, no. uh, narratively speaking. Um, yeah, mm. the, the the women are uh, for no other reason told to stay behind because they're women yeah I th- that hasn't dated particularly well but it's sort of funny it sort of works because it suits uh kaftan's um plan yeah she she kind of concedes that she does want to stay because she's exactly where she needed to be yes yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and of course um victoria protests mm-hmm. yeah which is good you know victoria is not a not a push around uh in that sense so so, so that's quite nice. You get it's a bit of um, it's a bit of sixty sexism, but um, but at the same time, it does sort of in a in an odd way work for the story's benefit. It doesn't actually, you know, you've got you've got this bit of sexism and just kind of for God's sake. But actually, in a strange way, it serves the plot uh, because uh, Victoria. Um, makes a bit of a song and dance about about it you know it gives her character some backbone and she's not a push around which is great and actually it because as we said it because Kaftan want is where she wants to be so it allows Kaftan uh Kaftan's and Eric's um plan to come to fruition so even though now with modern view uh, as modern viewers just going for god's sake really it doesn't stand it doesn't stink too much because in an odd way it's sort of allows the story to function yeah in victoria it does allow her to um kind of grow through this is she's objectified like this and we have a few exchanges with her and is it captain hopper yeah that's hopper. right yeah, yeah um, who, who'd be a woman or how would you know and then she shoots him down in, in like the, the last episode so her yeah, her, yeah. her wit and overcoming this um kind of develops through the story mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's true yeah so Kraft and Victoria and Viner enter the revitalizing room, um, if that's what we call it. Victoria realizes that the Cybermen must have been giants because there is a, a very big rejuvenating pod. What do, what do we call this room? <laughs> I think rejuvenating. Yeah, I, I think that's a good name for it. Yeah. Jamie and the other lad enter the the shooting room, or the target room. <laughs> Yes, yeah, he assumes do, yeah. that the room must have been used um, to raise tiny caterpillars. <laughs> this wee caterpillar. Yeah. Bless. <laughs> yeah, which is just this. This it's this baby Cybermat. Eric can't seem to figure out the logic problem. The Doctor presents him with a solution. Is the Doctor being a bit naive here, providing him with a solution, or does the Doctor just love chaos? I mean, he's kind of just taking this whole adventure for a ride and seeing it through yeah so, that's true does the but doctor secretly secretly love chaos i don't think so so like my reading of it because i, I don't want to jump too far ahead but um because you uh, asked the question in the second episode um eric has discovered the or has come very close to discovering the logic uh, puzzle in order to open the hatch which leads down to the tomb but he misses one sort of like one step and the doctor um, just does it and makes Eric think that he was the one who solved it. So the doctor is actually responsible for the hatch and access to the tombs uh, in the first place. I, mm. My sort of reading of it is um, 
he's aware that this expedition has arrived. They're trying to discover the Cybermen. And I think he's sort of right. I'm in a position to sort of control the situation and see where it goes. Rather than them let... Because if, if I let them just to get on with it, Lord knows what's going to happen. It's the Cybermen. So if I hang around, yeah. I can potentially defeat them. And I'd rather head this off at the pass rather than let them just crack on with it. I, you know, So that's my sort of reading of it. Maybe. Um, if this is the scene that I'm thinking of, is this the where the Doctor presses a button or pulls a lever? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, my interpretation of that was uh, Klieg had got the the solution correct and the Doctor did something to throw him off and then Klieg corrected it again. Uh, obviously, maybe I just misinterpreted that. Too. No, no, because if because what he does is goes, he gets really excited and he realises that, I was like, oh, fantastic, I've got this, uh, I've worked it out. So then he tries it he did get one step of his wrong. He misread one of his notes, but it doesn't right, work. Yeah. And the doctor, if you notice, he's sort of like watching what he's doing. And then mm-hmm. when Klee goes, ah, oh, I think it's something like, uh, it's F2, not F4, something like that. Uh, right. So then he corrects his own mistake, then goes to finish it, and then the doctor presses the button. But it's interesting, sort of, you know, you got that scene and we've, we've both read it in different ways, uh, mm. which is interesting. Yeah. But as I said, that's my that's been my reading of it. There is another part of this story we'll get to that um, was a mi- misinterpretation on my part. Oh, right, okay. Um, so, as soon as Victoria gets into the chamber, crafting closed the door on her. Mm-hmm. The bitch. <laughs> <laughs> the bitch. <laughs> yes, yeah. Viner's desperate to get the door open. He leaves the room to get help. Um, so, as soon as crafting is alone, um, she goes on to activate the control panel, but the doctor stops her just in time and Victoria's out Mm -hmm. what would the machine have done though (laughs) I don't know I mean it's because later on we discovered that is to revitalize the Cybermen so I assume that it would have used electronic waves to build up energy so maybe it would have electrocuted her or something like that I don't think it would have done her the world of good so Jamie and uh, Peter are now in the target room. Um, Jamie's compelled to stare at the wall now. He's kind of hypnotised. Uh, mm-hmm. Peter guesses that it's some kind of subliminal target. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of the characters really being on the ball and guessing what things are. Like Crafton assumed the whole room was to revitalise them. And now with this guy's like, oh, I, I just assume it's, uh, it's a target practice room because there must be a subliminal target. <laughs> Um, so they're very, very on the ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The doctor walks into the target room um, while Peter's trying it out, but a Cyberman slides out of nowhere, and Peter is shot in the back by a gun emerging from the wall. Mm-hmm. And that's the end of part one. Yep. So, on to part two. The doctor points out that Peter was shot in the back, so he wants Jamie to repeat what he did. Um, when he tells everyone that they can leave um, if they don't want to be there, um, Jamie turns and leaves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the doctor tells him not to. So again, that's yeah. that's a nice little uh, comic moment, which is uh, which is yeah. nicely done. Yeah. Um, or the Cyberman, Cyberman emerges, and um, the gun emerges from the wall and shoots its head off, and Victoria screams. Uh, the doctor examines the Cybermat, and Victoria puts it in her bag. As you would. So, yeah, yeah as you would. And we know that's going to come to something at some point later in the story. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Back in the control room, Toberman says to Crafton, it is done. Mm-hmm. So we know that he's smashed the ship. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, because it's, it's not long after, you know, it's like it is done. It's like, oh, well, what's done? And then not long after, um, I think it's, uh, it's Captain Hopper who sort of like barges into the room and tells everyone that all the engines have been destroyed. Professor Parry's had enough, so he rounds everyone up um, and says that he's going to cut the expedition short mm-hmm. and return home. Um, Crafton obviously um, seen this coming. Hence the fact that she's got Toberman to sabotage the ship. Yeah. Someone's um, balls up the fuel pumps, I think Hopper says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Viner thinks that they should return to the rocket. He's a bit of a wimpy. He's very... Um, he didn't even want to go on the expedition in the first place. He thought they were unprepared. So, 
Yeah, because he's, uh, he, he's played by sorry, it's just he's played by an actor called Cyril Shapps. He's a good actor. He's sort of like one of those actors who seems to have been in pretty much everything. I was looking at his uh, IMDb, and uh, I'll just have to point out that in 1981 he was in a TV miniseries called Fanny by Gaslight. I just, okay. leave, I just leave that there. There's a TV series <laughs> out there called Fanny by Gaslight. Um, interesting. Interesting, yeah. But he was also in other Doctor Who stories. He was uh, After this, he was in The Ambassadors of Death, which was a John Pertwee story. Uh, he was in episode one only of Planet of the Spiders, and he was also in the Tom Baker story, The Androids of Tara. He's a good actor, uh, but he always seems to play, or certainly the things I've seen him in uh, an awful lot, he, he always tends to play these sort of these um, these anxious hand ringing type characters, and he certainly uh, plays that character here, doesn't he? Oh yes, he's, yeah. he's always certainly. <laughs> it seems the moment he arrived, he wanted to bugger off. Uh, it's like, well, why, think, why did you come in the first? I think most of the pe- most of the people here, they're they're a right bunch of characters, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. Um, no one seems to particularly like each other much. Everyone seems to rub each everyone up the wrong way. Captain Harper yeah. comes barging in. With, um, being big and American. Yes. No telling, room to work. Got it? <laughs> yeah, telling everyone, and that's how it is. Um, <laughs> it seems to be at, at every God given moment, that's how it is. Um, being big, brass, and American, which is just great. So, yeah, there's a lot of uh, very colourful characters here, and I think they're all they're all cast superbly. But, yeah, Civil Shaps, I mean, I all, I'm always relieved for, for him when he, when, <laughs> when he gets killed. Yeah, just oh, he doesn't he doesn't have to suffer anymore. Poor old thing. So yeah, repairs are gonna take seventy two hours non stop. Um, so yeah, pretty much they're stuck in the tomb <laughs> yep. for quite a while. Eric easily convinces Parry to continue exploring. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah, he's just gonna take the risk and go for it. And um, Parry points out that there are metal caverns down below, all interconnected. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if the tomb is larger than we've, we've seen on screen. Maybe there's more sleep chambers. Possibly. Could, I mean, could, I, I, th- could I there think... Could be an army? Yeah, I, with cert- some of the dialogue, as you said, I think we are supposed to be under the impression um, that this whole complex is a lot larger than, than perhaps w- we see. And um, it's, it's quite amazing, actually, because I think uh, the set designs are really rather good. Um, and the, the, there is a sense of, of scale. Uh, but th- I think that's to do with the direction because if if you have the the DVD um, and you watch uh, and you uh, see the the photographs which are included on there, which includes the sets, you actually realise how bloody small they were. They were mm-hmm. You know, they were really tiny. But yes. uh, but I don't. I, I'm not aware of that when when I'm watching it. Um, like the the control room doesn't seem to be that small, um, but in reality it was. Um, so I think it was it was shot quite well, but yeah, I think the impression is supposed to be, you know, we're only seeing a, a certain section. Of... Yeah, and there could could be more Cybermen. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yes, um, as we were saying earlier, Eric manages to open the Blake Seven hatch, and <laughs> they prepare to investigate. When Eric asks Perry about uh, the women, he says. They, of course, um, will stay up here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> As you can expect, Victoria protests and the Doctor wants her to keep an eye on crafting. So she agrees to stay. Um, yeah. 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 And of course, like I said, crafting is exactly where she needs to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So again, it's 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 one of those things. Of, going, of course, the women have to stay here and not and not allowed to progress the story <laughs> under any circumstances whatsoever. <laughs> but it is they do sort of get away with it because the, the doctors obviously cottoned on to um, Kafton and, and Eric that you know <laughs> something odd about these two, um, <laughs> but with how subtle they are. Um, yes. But uh, so you know, it's saying look if you. Can you keep an eye on her? Because you know, she's a bit, she's a bit dodgy. So the sort of get away with it that you know she's she's given something to do. Um, but yeah, it is a bit, uh, it is a bit. <laughs> you women stay here, and you're not allowed to you know have have any adventures in this action adventure series. We blokes will deal with the situation. Crafton gets some food for Victoria. Mm-hmm. 
she gives which us some nice, chicken, you know, which is yeah. nice of her. Yeah, yeah, until she drugs it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, until she drugs the coffee. Yeah, uh, but you know, swings and roundabouts. <laughs> but it's like a pill or a tablet, so she doesn't eat it. Yeah, she doesn't lost her appetite. I like that. I, she she actually wondered because she was like, "What was it? What are the options? Uh, chicken, beef, and something else? Veal or something? I don't know." Ah, oh, veal. Yes, that was it. I yeah. was like, "Wow." Um, yeah. But she was, you know, she asked for chicken. <laughs> I just love this idea. It's like, what was she expecting? Just a full chicken. <laughs> Bam! There you go. <laughs> Carve it yourself, love. And it, but the fact is, a tablet. I mean, it is rather odd, but yeah, that puts her off, and she's yeah. suddenly not hungry anymore. So the team enters the main tomb. Eric wants to warm things up a little bit. <laughs> um, but then they hear the hatch close. Ooh. Mm. So Crafton's closed the hatch. Um, Eric claims that he can open the hatch from down below. So he begins to awaken the Cybermen intentionally. Mm. Um, and we get a shot of the Cybermen um, waking up in their sleep chambers. Yes, yeah, um, which is... Um... Very iconic shot. <laughs> oh, it's incredibly iconic, um, and it's sort of one of those images which just which just sticks with you. I think the first time I ever saw it was when it was part of the Thirty Years in the Tardis, or more than Thirty Years in the Tardis, thirtieth um, anniversary documentary, and it looked fantastic. And it's uh, it's I think it still does, and it, it, it there's a reason why it remains iconic. It's a fantastic image, uh, and that wonderful use of of models tying in very well actually with the, with the actual set. And seeing all the Cybermen emerge from the tomb, and it, it should look—you would think it would look roby because the, you know I've got these. I think Morris Barry once described them as giant egg, egg boxes, but the actual design of them are, is really quite good. And you know, in reality, or what it is, is a bunch of people in costume breaking out of Clane Fulham. Yes. Uh, at these tombs, but uh, I find it very, very easy to suspend my disbelief because I think actually the overall design of it, the way that it's shot in the atmosphere and the music, just yeah. sells everything, and it's it's great. I love it. And we've got this wide shot, this model shot that mm. we see of the ice defrosting. Yeah. Um, and of course the in your mind you can you you know that these two things are two different things. Is it, is it one's one's the actual set, one's not. Mm -hmm. Um. But the two kind of do go hand in hand visually. Um, yes, yeah. Yeah, there's not too much difference there. Um, and of course, um, so then he shuts the machine off, putting them back to sleep, and um, Eric goes off it and resumes the awakening. <laughs> so Victoria wakes up and kicks off with crafting, um, but she pulls a gun on her. And mm -hmm. then, I was going to say Jamie's little caterpillar, but that, that sounds weird. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, it does, yeah. It sort of sends you here often enough. <laughs> okay, the baby said, Matt. Um, <laughs> there comes you go, out, yeah. Um, yeah. And jumps on crafting. Um, I'm not sure why she passes out. Is it from fright? Or does the Cybermat knock her out? That's a good question, actually, because I think you could easily read it either way. I mean, actually thinking about it, uh, you don't really establish what the Cybermats are supposed to do. So... They've got very spongy, pointy teeth. Yeah, but you know, it's sort of the, the actual threat of them isn't really established. So why do people no. freak out about them? But I think Captain doesn't seem to be someone who would who would faint with fright because a, a small uh, thing's jumped on her shoulder. Yeah, she might be startled by it, but I wouldn't see that she would faint unless the whole her whole personality's up front. I've I always thought that because later on they apparently um, pick up they're, they're able to detect humans by their brain waves or something yes so it's jumped onto her shoulder maybe it's it it's done something her, to her to make her collapse well that would make sense cause, because mm. why would the cybermen create something that would hurt or destroy humans when they need them alive yeah that's true yeah so the cybermat the purpose of the cybermat could be to find and incapacitate humans mm -hmm. just for the conversion mm. yeah I think yeah I think that's probably the the best way to read it but yeah I yeah. think there is a bit of confusion because it isn't it isn't really spelt out no it does move in a very creepy way doesn't it it's like very slow and then it kind of dots around really fast well yeah because this is another thing because um, the Cybermats I mean because we, we see larger versions which I think look better but this sort of like this baby version looks a bit cute both versions, I mean, re I mean, I think actually, 
I know that they did uh, attempt to bring them back in a Matt Smith episode. I think it was called Closing mm-hmm. Time. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I think I think it's one of those things which, which if you were to try to bring it back into the series, wouldn't work. Um, it's it's one of those things which works in the classic series, and I think that's fine because I actually think the Cybermat really should be something that we you know when you look at them, and they they should be deemed a bit ridiculous. Um, yeah. And although it's it's not a it's not a favorite story of mine, but if you if you ever look at the, which is the other Patrick Tratton um, Cyberman story, the Wheel in Space, because there's yes. a couple, uh, I think there's two episodes of that we were able to watch. The Cybermats and that story are used really well, uh, and actually because it's part of that thing where some of the characters react to them, oh, aren't you cute? But then actually they're, they're, they're actually, you know, the way that they're able to destroy metal, <coughs> and then later mm. they're able to uh, capacitate and actually kill people. I think they, they they work really well in that story. This one it it isn't quite established, but I think the way their shot works. Um, I think it could have been. I think it could have easily ventured in the ridiculous, but somehow it works. Yeah, um, maybe maybe we did get too many close-ups of them barely working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so Eric tells everyone his true motives, um, logic and power. Yeah. Um, so now. All these years, I've gotten something wrong about this story. Um, something that confused me, and I haven't really questioned it before. But he says he's from the Brotherhood of Logicians. Um, I, I remember. I, 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 sorry, preemptive, because finish that. Because it'd be interesting to see whether it's the same thing. Because there's been a couple of times where I have completely misheard that, and I thought he said something else. But I'll. So, so anyway, so sorry. What's your confusion? So until revisiting this story last week, um, for the sake of the podcast, I always thought he'd said the Brotherhood of Magicians. Yes, that's exactly yes. what I thought. Uh, I'm... Something like like the Magic Circle. Or something. <laughs> that's what I thought. I remember the first time I got the Brotherhood of Magicians. This doesn't make right. Okay, it doesn't quite make sense, but I'll go along with it. Yeah. Um... I always found it even stranger later on the fact that the Cyber Controller is saying that he'll make a great Cyberman because he's a magician. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember the. F- in fact, because funny enough, uh, when I was rewatching uh, the story for the purposes of this podcast, again I misheard it the first time. Going to the Brotherhood of Magicians because I completely forgot it. <laughs> it had been a while since I watched. Just, uh, it doesn't make any sense. All right, there are just a bunch of nutters. And I'll just leave it at like that. And then later on, the ah fr- oh, logicians got it. Yeah. So I, I th- <laughs> please, it's not just me. Um, <laughs> When I was younger, I thought like there was a different perception of what a magician was in the sixties. <laughs> oh, but uh, a legitimate um, field in science or something. Sixties <laughs> <laughs> weren't that backward, <laughs> or were they? Uh, but just... <laughs> fantastic. But yeah, I've I've heard that as well. I thought we said the Brotherhood of Magicians, and I was just like, what? All right then. So the Cybermen opened the chamber of the Cyber Controller. He didn't get any cling film. Um, no, he gets to squat. He, he, he spent the whole budget on his door. <laughs> and again, I love it. Right, okay, so it, it looks good because you've got this, this huge tomb and on the ground level, it bang in the centre, you've got a, a Cyberman logo, silver, on a black background and it looks great and then it's revealed to be a door and then inside the door... Like you know how uh, the number five is uh, depicted on dice, with yeah. four dots on the outside and one in the middle. Uh-huh. You've got the same Cyberman image laid out in exactly the same way on the inside of the door. And so <laughs> it's just like, that's dedicated. That's that's dedication to this. Uh, they've got a great design of a logo. Oh my god, are they going to use it? Um, yeah, it's bloody everywhere. But yeah, you see the cyber uh, cyber controller uh, squatting. So there's um. There's no bits and pieces all over his suit. Um, no. And he has a big brain. <laughs> oh, is that what that is? Okay. <laughs> or a very fearsome hat. <laughs> oh, he's a dick. Anyway, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, massive, uh, it's a massive brain. So Eric talks to the controller. Um, 
and he talks as if he's got some authority over him for um, for releasing them. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know the cyber controller is having none of it. Um, you belong to us. You shall be like us. Yeah, it's not having. Yeah, because they have these the, uh, these strange buzzy uh, sounds of of speaking, which I think is quite effective. I like how the mouth hatch opens. Yeah, it's uh, it's really quite chilling and. It, it looks great, and um, the sound of the voice is good. I think this is probably the best cliffhanger in um, in the ep- uh, in the story. I mean, one, it's again, it's an it's another iconic moment, but um, I think it's it's really good. I mean, you could easily say, for example, it hadn't been done here, and they had a two part Cyberman story. You could easily have that as a cliffhanger today, and it would still work. Because it's you know it's, it's it's ominous and creepy, so um, so yeah, it's a it's a, it's a great clipping. Perry asks, "How did they know that they would come and release them?" And the cyber controller explains that it was a trap, um, for intelligent minds to solve the logic solutions and free them. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, that's a bit of a gamble, sealing yourself away. You think they would have had some kind of redundancy in place to open the hatch from the inside? Yeah, you would have, but uh, but they didn't. So the doctor set decides to play for time, but when he talks to the controller, he reveals that their hist- history computer has details of him, so they remember the doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, and he mentions the events of the two previous Cybermen stories, Moonbase, also starring Tr- Star Troughton, and The Tenth Planet, the final story of William Hartnell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that's right. So n- nice bit of continuity there. Mm-hmm. So they're all to become the first in a new race of Cybermen and they'll then take over the Earth. We then have a bit of a comedic run and chase scene with all the characters running around the same corridor set with the Cybermen making funny sounds. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, in terms of running around the set, uh, the, the same set, again, it's sort of, I think... I think you know, we as modern audience, you know, there's someone in the 21st century watching a piece of television from 1967. I think you're aware that, you know, uh, Fraser Hines has been made to run around the same bit of flattage uh, and pretend it's somewhere else. But again, I think, um, I think that's being aware of um, television production, um, especially being, you know, Doctor Who fans, you, you're kind of aware of how the show was made. Um but again, I, I wasn't, you know, watching that, I wasn't bothered by it. I didn't think it was too much of a, of, of a limitation. Again, I was able to suspend my disbelief. Toberman's picked up whilst fighting, and you can see what I can only assume are some kind of cyber cables lifting him up off the ground. Yeah, so I think this is one instance where uh, the, the, the visual aspect of the story doesn't quite work, which is the fight sequences. Um, and this is one of them. And again, I don't because uh, in the fourth episode, uh, there's a bit where uh, Toberman has a fight with the uh, the cyber leader, um, you know, and he's fighting him, and they go off screen, and then he comes back, and it's clearly he's carrying this big rubber figure, um, made to look like the cyber leader, and it uh, it's yeah, it's a bit of a shame because it's um, otherwise visually, I think the story is really quite quite captivating. Um, mm, yeah, it does but, look like a bit of a bit of a mannequin. Unless it's just unless it is the actor, and he's just really dedicated <laughs> to the role. But uh, no, I think that those are instances where I think the, the limitations of, of of the production show, and it's a bit of a shame. Um, I mean, I can't blame them uh, because of uh, the time scale and the way that television was made. But um, it if is only of... it could have been a bit of a wider shot. Yeah, and I mean the, the, so the this initial there. one with uh, where you can see. Um, Roy Stewart, the actor playing Toberman, that he has been on, he is on a Kirby wire. I do think had uh, a bit, if the camera angle had been chosen a bit more carefully, maybe slightly to the side and and lower down, um, you know, it could have easily been covered up. Um, yeah. However, having said that, though, I mean, I think it was, I think, keep in mind uh, how television the the size of television screens in the 1960s and the amount of lines and and pixels they would have seen maybe it wouldn't have been that apparent to someone viewing it in 1967 yeah yeah 
Blame the restoration team. <laughs> Bloody restoration team making making us be able to see things better. Damn them. Um, but, uh, you know, because uh, I don't want to, bl- you know, because uh, a lot of hard work and dedication went into making, uh, you know, television programs like this. So I, I don't want to be too cruel on them. But yeah, it, I mean, watching it now, it is it, it is incredibly obvious and it is a bit of a shame because it does take you out of it, out of the viewing yeah. experience. But uh, um, they'd be quite easily to remove digitally, I'd imagine now. Do you think um, you'd welcome corrections added to things for the Blu-ray releases? Only if they're optional. Um, I don't mind um, releases having, you know, modernised CGI effects or whatever, if they're optional. Um, mm. Because I much, I, you know, I want to see how things were when they were originally created. Um, yeah. Because of, of for, for all sorts of reasons. But, I mean, if you go down the route of just constantly correcting these things, all you're doing is rewriting history, essentially. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that I'm uncomfortable with. They wouldn't do it to a movie or a song. I mean, it's it's someone else's creative um, kind of property, isn't it? Yeah, and well, because I remember that this actually opened up a debate. Um, I think it was around about 2001, s- s- sometime there. You know the Beatles Abbey Road album cover because it's it's you know it's famous, and you've got the Beatles going across uh, the zebra crossing on Abbey Road. You see Paul McCartney; he has a cigarette uh, in his hand. Okay. And in America during two thousand and one, they airbrushed the cigarette out. Okay. And this started this whole thing because it was just like, well, smoke smoking is irresponsible. Mm. Uh, you don't want to promote it. Remove the image. It's like, yeah, but that's an iconic image that was taken in nineteen sixty nine. The Beatles at the time were famous for smoking. That is part of the image. You're you're changing history. Uh, and it sort of it opened sort of like a conversation about it and a lot of people didn't like it and it's, it's pointless and it, it's needless um, and I think this sort of thing is the same if you have the option to you know watch Tomb of the Cybermen with uh, with certain little corrections but you're able to watch the original as well you're not you know you're not removing the original completely out of history or at all out of history yeah. then, then that I think is fine it's like Star Wars a lot of people won't even know what the originals look like yeah and I think I think that is a shame. I think, uh, you know, you, you had Star Wars that came out in 1977. It was a huge monumental moment in cinematic history. Whether you like the movie or not, it was seismic in, uh, in movie popularity, in, in film making, and the popularity of science fiction. It had a huge impact. And yet, for a generation or two, probably going on to three generations now, we are not able to watch the film that was originally released in the cinema in 1977. No, not in any good quality at least. Um, It has been released on, of course it was on VHS. I I know the originals quite intimately because I've watched them so much before 97. Right, okay. Um, So I'm I'm able to recognise all the differences, or the major ones at least. So of course they were available on VHS commercially, they were released on DVD as a limited edition. Hmm. But the, the weren't... The quality wasn't that wasn't there, you know. They hadn't been restored. Of course, the master version of that um, supposedly doesn't exist in any um, in any way that they could restore it. That's extraordinary. Um, if if that's true, I mean, I, I can understand that maybe the original film would be in poor condition because the more the movie is popular, the more the film needs to be handled and so on. But mm. we have movies which which were stored in poor condition, which are much, much older than Star Wars, and yet they've been able to be, you know, restored. Mm. Um, maybe not completely for, for certain reasons, but, you know, some work has, you know, to, to clean up the film and the image. Some work has been able, you know, we, we've got um, Metropolis, for example, which inspired, you know, which was an inspiration, f- which was a phenomenal science fiction movie, very inspirational. It, it it inspired Star Wars. It inspired Blade Runner. Um, that came out, and I think in 1927, um, that's they've been able to remaster that. So I find it rather extraordinary and somewhat unbelievable that the original version of Star Wars they haven't been able to do anything with. Mm, it's bizarre. Yeah, it is. Who anyway. knows? Maybe they're just sitting on top of it, waiting to release it. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I mean, it um, might be true because, as we know, you know, Disney owns uh, the rights to Star Wars, and I think it's it's well known that there is an appetite for the original movies to be remastered and to be re- or oh, uh, restored uh, and be released. So, ha- having said what I've just said, it's um, I mean, one I do find I still find it extraordinary. But having said that, though, I think there's enough people to realise that there is a there is a there is a market want. For, for people to view the original movies as in, in the best possible way. So if they are able to do it, surely they would have done it by now. That's mm. a bit of, that's a funny one. So Hopper from the ship, he throws smoke grenades and they all manage to escape. Um, but Toberman's overpowered and held captive. Uh-oh. Um, mm-hmm. Finally, they all emerge from the hatch. But one Cyberman follows them and grabs the Doctor's leg. You know, mm-hmm. thankfully, Victoria beats him up with a flask, <laughs> and <laughs> they shut the hatch. Yeah. Um, of course, Eric's still down there, mm-hmm. and then he comes up, bangs on the hatch, and they agree to let him out. So I was surprised that Eric got out so soon. You know, the fact, the very fact that he was stuck down there, uh, made me originally made me think, um, okay, he's there's a purpose for him to be down here. How is this going to progress the story? But no, he just comes. He comes straight back up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So it was a bit, um, a bit pointless mm. all that. But they lock Eric and Crafting up in the, the gun room, the testing room, and as you would, she, of course, yeah. And she, she points out to him that there's a gun there. So they take it off, and he identifies it as a small X-ray laser. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So great, they've got a weapon. It just it's a it's a strange pairing, Eric and Crafton. Um she seems focused on the objectives, but Eric's desire seems uh, more self serving. Um I wonder if Crafton's working more for the the Brotherhood and Eric's um thinking more about himself. Do you uh, pick up on that? There's quite there's quite a difference between them. Yeah, you're right, because I think Captain seems to be a bit more on the ball and is able to plan things a lot better. And even when the plans change, she's able to adapt quite quickly. She's the, I think she's more the clever one. Uh, Klieg is is actually quite emotional for, for someone who's supposed to be very logic. Uh, he's obviously very clever uh, and he's able to work things out. But, um, you know, when things don't go his way, he gets very despondent quite quickly. And then when someone goes, oh, you know, and, you know, he, he responds to moods, very, you know, he shifts around all over the place. So it's actually quite emotional. Um, so, yes, I wonder if Crafton was more of the mastermind behind this because she didn't she didn't risk sending Toberman to open the door. She sent someone else and she doesn't risk herself going down the tomb. The tomb. No. So maybe she um, she she sent um and Eric, maybe he he was a tool of hers. Possibly that's a, that's a, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, the other thing as well, because uh, it's established later on, I think in the fourth episode, you know, Klieg is unhinged as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he is a power you know he's a power hungry maniac. Um, but yeah, I think I think uh, Kafton's obviously the the much more yeah the much much cleverer more yeah. She, she, yeah, she's the one who's able to function a lot better. Yeah, maybe. Um, there's a great scene with the Doctor and Victoria. The talk of his age. He asks Victoria if she's happy travelling with them. And after talking of her father, she says that the Doctor probably can't remember his family, but he says he can when he wants to. And mm. when he doesn't, they sleep in his mind. And explains that her memories of her father won't always be a sad one. It's a very common to terms way of dealing with um, bereavement. And she finds that there's so much um, else to think about. That no one in the universe can do what they're doing, he tells her. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but right. it's a nice, nice little scene. It's a lovely scene. It's one of those things, uh, classic Doctor Who was always, you know, especially when uh, the, the show came back in 2005, the, the classic run of the show was always criticised for not being emotional enough or having character character developed moments i think scenes like this completely disprove that the only difference is that they were i think much more understated uh than they are now that you know when emotion is is written into drama now it's much more 
you know, a bit more on the nose and, you know, people wearing emotions on their sleeve. But this is uh, this is an absolutely delightful scene. And, um, you know, um, it's great, you know, uh, Victoria missing her father, feeling emotional, and the Doctor reassuring her and comforting her. And I think the the lines are really good and both the actors play that scene uh, very well. And it's it's quite, you know, it's, uh, it is lovely. It's, it's certainly one of the highlights of the, the story. Ooh, so instantly after this, the Cybermats engage them in the control room. The Doctor rounds everyone up and he fries the Cybermats with a power cable. Mm -hmm. He says, you might say they've had a complete mental breakdown. <laughs> and Jamie's, Jamie's quite upset by this. Oh yeah, he's just gone, ooh, that's a bad book. Uh, and the, the Doctor apologises. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting a nice, nice little moment. So Eric and Crafton emerge and Eric fires the gun. Cliffhanger. <laughs> Who's he killed? Episode 4, he's killed no one important. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's, it's even later revealed that he hasn't actually killed them. <laughs> it's sort of, you know, everyone's seen, you murderer. I, I mean, I think it's established that, you know, he's he's a poor shot. Because he was clearly aiming for the Doctor and then hit the, hit uh, Mr. Nameless. Uh, but then later on, he is, don't they pick him up and he seems to be fine? I think he was just hitting the shoulder <laughs> or something. Eric's confident he can bargain with the same men. Now that he, he has their weapon. Um, so he summons the cyber controller. Um, the Cybermen have now prepared Toberman. Um, some of the Cybermen go back to sleep to preserve their energy. The controller emerges from the hatch. This definitely feels like a very dangerous moment. You know, he's this big towering figure. He must be powerful because he's the leader. The threat's really becoming real. You know, they're, they're near the surface. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, the controller releases Toberman. He's still under air. Cyberman control. Mm -hmm. We'll have that cool effect with for the brain waves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's effective. It works. I quite like it. Yeah. So he agrees to let the cyber controller be revitalized, but he sends um, Parry and the Doctor and Jamie with them, doesn't he? Parry the Doctor and Jamie go with the cyber controller into the room. Yeah. Um, and of course, he's not much of a threat. He's he's quite sluggish, and he he has to ask for help to get into the into the into the booth, into the chamber. Yeah, yeah. So his energy is completely uh, depleted. So he's not the the threat that they supposed. So why on earth do they rejuvenate him? Because mm. it was established in the first episode. You know, you were able to clo you know cl uh, close the door into this this booth uh, and not have the rejuvenator go on. Uh, and like he can barely stand. He yeah, he just... can barely stand. But you know. It makes sense. The Doctor goes, well, we can trap him in there he, and he's not going anywhere. But why, why switch on the thing which is going to give him more power? It doesn't make any sense. Jamie's not probably would have worked better on him when he was, um, when he was weak. Mm. <laughs> so meanwhile, Victoria tells Eric and Crafton that there's another cyber weapon in, in there with the others. Mm. Um, so they decide to just remain vigilant and not go in just in case, um, in case they've already retrieved the weapon. Yeah. So it seems the cyber controller may have been slightly overcharged because he couldn't get out because their machine was starting to smoke, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And he, he busts out. Jamie's ropes didn't really work. The controller communes with Toberman. Um, and Toberman then strikes Eric. And the Cyberman, Cyberman emerges, doesn't he, from the, from the hallway. Um, Crafton refuses to open the tomb. So after the controller opens it... She instantly closes it again. You know, the controller turns and he's not happy and he shoots her. <laughs> it looks like it hurts. Yeah. It's quite a death. Quite a hard death. I mean, it, it's funny because uh, the open open the hatch, she then closes it. And then he approaches her and you think he's going to shoot her, but he doesn't. He opens the hatch up himself. It's only when she shoots him, that's when the cyber leader decides to kill her. Even though he says that the gun will have no effect on him. Yeah, well, I guess ironically, the um, the Cybermen are more logical than them. Yes, it, uh, of course. Yeah. Why would he kill her just out of frustration? He wouldn't. No, no, he, exactly. Yeah, that, that it's a, it's a moment that makes sense. Um, yeah. And it says that you know, even if you do have the Brotherhood of Logicians, um, logicians, um, they uh, they're still human. So. You know, they would still behave as such, so it's just um, Cybermen just take it to the next <laughs> the next logical step. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to phrase that in a different way, but anyway. 
we have an important moment here. The, the Doctor reasons with Toberman. He rebels against the Cyber Controller. He had the will to regain his freedom from saving the Cybermen, only to avenge Crafton, of whom he was a servant for. Yeah, it's sort of interesting, but then uh, it's sort of... That, yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, and you go, maybe you know, maybe it's to do with the you know that there was there was loyalty there and you know a human mm. connection which is breaking through, and that's how he's able. It's sort of funny with Toberman. You um you get a sort of impression that he was supposed to be. You know, he's called Toberman, and he's very strong. And you've got the Cybermen who are very strong, and he kind of. I've always wondered if um, there was, you know, Toberman was supposed to reflect something, or you know, um, and actually, years ago, I read something which apparently um, he was supposed to have been someone who had, hit, you know, had had an accident and his his, uh, his head had been fractured, and to right. depict this, they were supposed to have this this uh, thing encasing his head, but they didn't have time to to build it. Um, build this prop so that's why you don't see it but then i only seen that once i've seen in a couple of places where apparently turboman was intended to be deaf and so wore a hearing aid um mm. and this was apparently him having to wear a hearing aid was the, the idea was that he was supposed to it was supposed to reflect a little bit of like a little bit of cyber technology and maybe to so maybe toberman was supposed to be this halfway house between what it is to be human and what it is to be a cyberman and the idea okay. is that at the end um you know humanity wins out so that side of him is is what help you know helps him defeat evil which in this case is the cyberman so you I get the impression that there was something he he was supposed to be a much more interesting character, but uh, for time it wasn't really written into the script, and they weren't able to make the the necessary props. Instead, we're left scratching our heads, thinking, "What what was the message here?" Yeah, because I think it's a it's it's a shame because I get the impression that 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 was the intention, but actually, what comes across is. Um, you know, a big, powerful black man who who doesn't seem to be quite intelligent, doesn't speak too much, and is just used for his physical strength. Um, which, you know, when you analyse it in that sense, is uncomfortable. Especially when she says, yeah, he's just my servant. Yeah, I mean, sir, you know, servant's different to slave, but I think, I think the comparisons could be made. I mean, I, it would be interesting, because the actor who played uh, Toberman's Roy Stewart... And he's a really interesting. Um, he's a really interesting figure. So I was. Um, so if you read up about him, because uh, he was he was born in Jamaica and uh, arrived in Britain in 1947, and apparently he had ambitions of becoming a doctor, but changed his changed his mind and became an actor. Because I mean, when you watch, you know, you see him. He, he does have an, uh, an impressive physique. And in 1954, he opened one of the first gyms in the UK that allowed all races to train there. There was no racial segregation. Wow. Um, okay. And I read somewhere that... Um, who was the actor who played um, uh, Darth Vader? David Prowse? Anyway, he, he used to train there. Um, oh, okay. Uh you know, uh, and then he he also appeared. You know, in terms of Doctor Who, he also he also played uh, the circus strongman in Terror of the Autons. Uh, but he was also in the first Roger Moore movie, Live and Let Die, and he played uh, Quarrel Junior. Oh. Uh, uh, but prior to his acting, he was uh, apparently a very well respected um, stuntman. So, very interesting guy. Very interesting history. And I kind of wonder if. Um, when he was approached to play Toberman, if it was if it was just presented to him as we the audience see it now, or if it was explained it was going to be a if it was going to be a bit more richer and a bit more developed and a bit more sort of a, a metaphor of you know what it is to be human and what it is to be a Cyberman. I don't know. I do get that. Yeah, it's a bit of a funny one. Then of course we get to that bit you mentioned earlier. Toberman off screen picks up a dummy of the controller. <laughs> And uh, launches him across the room. Yeah, flings him into the controls. The Cyberman head <laughs> falls off, 
but uh, but then we actually see the clearly the actor cutting their heads back on uh, collapse on the floor. Um, it is it is one of those ropey moments, which is a bit unfortunate. But so they descend into the tomb, um, Toberman and the Doctor, but they're unaware that Eric wakes up and he follows them down. Mm, mm-hmm. I was unsure about this moment because uh, I mean I may be completely wrong, but the impression I got of this was because when uh, the cyber leader uh, attacks uh, Eric, I got the impression that you know because we don't actually see it, but you get the the impression that it was uh, a very violent death, and I thought that was actually a very effective moment. Um, so when actually. Uh, and this was when the cyber leader had just been rejuvenated so he's got all the power he needs Um, so when Eric comes back I got the impression that it was the episode was under running and they did this to pad it out because from this point on nothing really of consequence happens they've sort of they've already defeated the cybermen but now they've got to go back and it just feels like the story's going a bit backwards and forwards at this point and I thought, actually, what was a very powerful ending of Klieg, um f- from the episode... Oh, n- no, he, he he wasn't. He was just sort of slightly knocked out. And, yeah, it was... Um, I just got the sense it was because uh, the episode was under running. I mean, I may be wrong, but I think it's a bit of a shame because that moment when you think Klieg is dead... Uh, yes. I actually thought that was... A, that, as I said, I thought that was quite a powerful moment. So, in the main tomb chamber... The Doctor wants to refreeze the Cybermen. Oh, of course, we get a scene where Toberman starts smashing the place up, and the Doctor's like, "No, he's being too loud. You're going to wake them up." <laughs> yes. For the love of having um, quiet, you more. But yeah, Eric arrives, and he won't let them um, put the Cybermen to sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, Jamie, of course, is quite loyal. He's followed the Doctor down, um, but he's discovered by Eric as well. So the three of them are held at gunpoint, mm-hmm. and. The Doctor kind of fuels Eric's egotistical vision. Um, I love this scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, it is good. Um, it's as if he's trying to take his side to deceive him at some point, but then he just comes out and says, well, now, are you, now I know you're mad. <laughs> I just wanted to make yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's it's a great punchline to, to that scene, and, uh, and then Eric just looking completely dumbfounded at that point. <laughs> it is great, yeah. But yeah. But yeah, imagine the Doctor was just trying to stall him as well. Mm-mm. Yeah. Because we all know what happens next. Um, Eric gets put in a headlock and then, and then hopefully killed this time. Yeah, I think, I think he's, I think he's, yeah, I think he's definitely <laughs> killed at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or maybe there's like a, a post-title scene that we've missed where he just wakes up <laughs> inside the tomb. So then, as the Doctor and Jamie set the Cybermen to sleep, Toberman battles with the Cyberman. But, but he wins in hand-to-hand combat. Um, the three of them emerge from the tomb safe and sound, um, or so we think. The Doctor then prepares to re-electrify the controls and the door, but the controller awakens. Oh, he's not dead either. <laughs> <laughs> Frig's sake. Yep. Yeah, so not dead after all. They run away but manage to close the door. I love how they get by and they're like, Jamie, you go this way, I'll go this way. And the cyber controller is frantically trying to grab either one of them. <laughs> he just can't make his mind up. <laughs> yeah. They run away, but they can't close the door because the doctor says they need an insulator because if, as soon as the door is closed, it will be re-electrified. But Toberman steps up and close, closes the door um, as the controller tries to escape. Um, you are evil. You shall never pass, Toberman. The door is closed, he says. And, um, and then they're both killed. Yeah, Toberman got his freedom, but it cost him his life. Mm. It did, and they just leave him there. The tomb of the Toberman. <laughs> yeah, you know, I never because I mean, a lot of people have died in this story. Um, because we actually had quite quite a lot of characters to begin with, and now we've only got uh, a handful of that. So everyone's quite you know despondent, which is understandable because a lot of people have died. Uh, and then so every, everyone departs and then you just and then it just it's obviously meant to be you know very poignant because uh, we 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 end looking at Toberman before then panning up to 
one of the, the Cyberman motifs. Like, but it's just like, well, you're just, you're just leaving him there. At least bury him or something. But, yeah. So the expedition, or what's left of it, and the Doctor and companions all part ways. But a Cybermat has escaped. Yes, yeah. Which I think is quite a, was quite a nice way of suggesting that, you know, it's uh, the Cybermoon could come back. Of course, that Cybermat probably just crawled around a bit and ran out of batteries. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> it, did, it didn't get off planet and rebuild the Empire. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. So that's that. That's the end of part four. So on to listeners' responses now. On Twitter, Ben and Polly said, pretty overrated, standout scene is two in Victoria's beautiful exchange. The rest is run of the mill, but I do I do love two. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Patrick Troughton's excellent in the story, and um, that scene between the Doctor and Victoria is, is delightful, and definitely a highlight. Um, yeah. I can see where they're coming with regards to overrated, but not completely. Uh, I'll explain what I mean by that when I sort of sum up my, my views on the story but um, but yeah I definitely agree Patrick Trouton's superb in this story and that scene is lovely yeah Jackson Hume said I love Tomb genuinely my favourite Cyberman story I think it's incredibly atmospheric and creepy and really showcases the danger of the Cybermen and yet is interspaced with great character moments for the TARDIS team with some wonderful humour there's nothing more scary than walking around a cyber tomb with all the disused experiments and just waiting for something to wake up. Brilliant Doctor Who, I'd say. Oh, that's, uh, I think that's probably a good summing up of how most people feel about the story for, for those who, who absolutely love it. Um, yeah, it's, it's certainly got a, a captivating atmosphere. It's very good. Yes. Peter Sigma's Doctor Who podcast said, It's brilliant and very atmospheric piece with the Cybermen at their most menacing in a very long time. Mm -hmm. Mike Clark said, I read the novelization as a kid and was fascinated by the Brotherhood of Logicians. See, he got it right first time. (laughs) But in fairness, he was reading it. Yes. Fascinated by the Brotherhood of Logicians wanting to bring order to the universe. When I eventually saw the series, I thought it was a solid story and visually striking. It's been a while since I've seen it, so my thoughts may be a tad blurred. Um, just to clarify, me and Liam did, did think that it was the Brotherhood of Magicians when we originally saw it, um, <laughs> in case anyone's just tuned in to the listeners' responses now. Yeah. Time Lord Iroh said, I find the Cybermen voices to be extremely great and even worse than the Tenth Planet. Overall, a decent enough story with a very touching scene between Doc and Victoria. It's been a while since I've watched it, but I don't remember it being as boring as the other classic Who apps. <laughs> so it speaks a fan of the classic Who. Fair enough. I quite like the Cybermen voices. I mean, having said that, though, I think um, I could see why they could be a bit irritating because I think sometimes it is a little bit. Well, actually, I think it can be a, may, perhaps a little bit difficult to understand uh, the dialogue through the this buzz voice box thing that they use. I think actually. I mean, I don't mind it, but I think what could be deemed irritating is that when the Cybermen are fighting and there's that constant weird garbling noise that they do in this episode, which is used an awful lot. I mean, I don't mind it, but I could see how that could be deemed irritating. Pull to Open said, Humans, plot and interest and great. Cybermen, intimidating at first, but kind of boring. Suspenseful atmosphere, ultimately better than the story itself. And why did they ever let the cyber controller recharge? That's a good point. Yes, exactly. Why? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's certainly a big logical hole in the story. Um, yeah, it is a, it is a, that is a puzzler. I totally agree with that. Doctor Who, the Target World podcast said, It's one of the stories that started my love for Doctor Who. It's a fantastic story, and last year I got on vinyl for Record Store Day, and it sounds excellent, great music, and the Cybermen look cool and quite menacing. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Um, and it got them into the show. 
That's brilliant. That's really good. Um, thank you, everyone, for getting in touch. Um, as always, we love reading out listeners' responses, so please get in touch every week. We'd be very grateful. And as a quick conclusion, um, we'll get on to the score. So, even though I picked it as my favourite, um, of course, it's not a perfect story. Um, and I've come to see that more today, I think. But I think it's a nice one to revisit. Um, I don't think Classic Who is boring, but for me, this is this is one I can just put on and watch and enjoy. You know, I don't have to endure it. Um, mm-hmm. I do quite like it. So under the score, the whole idea of us picking our favourite stories, then rating them, seems a bit redundant. <laughs> but here goes. Um, I do give this one an 8 out of 10. For me, the Tomb of the Sidemen is sort of like one of those stories where I can see why those who like it, like it, and like it to the extent that they do. And I know that Matt Smith cited the Tomb of the Cybermen as one of his favourite Doctor Who stories. Um, so it's, it's, it's had its fans over many years. I think the first episode's fantastic. I love the direction, the sense of atmosphere, um, the wonderful touches of humour. It's just perfect and it's really engaging. And that carries on into the second episode, and it has some of the um, some of the most iconic moments in the whole history of the program. It's from episode three onwards, and I start to have a problem with it. I think the story starts to peter out a bit, and it becomes it's sort of it's bizarre. Either it needed rewriting, or actually, this would have been a case where three episodes would have suited the story a lot better. I think. I think it just starts to peter out a bit, and. I kind of become aware of certain things are done maybe to pad out the um, the story. Um, Klieg's apparent resurrection in the fourth episode, for example, which we discussed before, is, is one is one example. But there are still great moments in that, like the one that we all cite, which is um, that conversation between the Doctor and Victoria. Um, so I can see why people really like it. It's got it's it's directed really well fantastic set designs costumes the music a really engaging sense of atmosphere but for me the story peters out a bit i haven't got a problem watching it but um i'm a i'm a bit disappointed i'm giving it the score but um i give it six out of ten <gasps> <laughs> sorry That's everyone good. but it's all right I mean, I'm saying it's better than average, but I think it's, uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, I don't, I don't enjoy it as, as many people perhaps do. Sure. Um, but you know what it's like? It's like Marmite. You either love it or you hate it. <laughs> yeah, unlike Vegemite, which is brilliant and everyone yeah. should love it. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew there was a, did you see that in earlier on intentionally? <laughs> Maybe, maybe I was doing a bit of sleight of hand, like the Doctor does in this story. It was all planned all along. It wasn't. Anyway. <laughs> um, but earlier on, I did mention that when um, Tomb of the Sidemen was originally released on VHS, it outsold um, Science of the Lambs the week it was released. And you put up a poll, didn't you, on um, Twitter? I did indeed. So let's have a look. You ran a poll and it received two votes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And I'm afraid it. it's neck and neck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, People are very torn. <laughs> Random question, but which is best? Tomb of the Cybermen or Silence of the Lambs? 50% each. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant, <laughs> Roderick. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> that was a bit of a dud. I did run one on Instagram earlier today, or yesterday, mm-hmm. um, rather. Um, how would you rate the Tomb of the Cybermen? 75% said good, 25% said bad. <laughs> Ooh. Um, all right, okay. Um, well, uh, uh, a lot of people seem to like it, which is good. Um, a lot more than they dislike, so... So I think it's I think by many it's still regarded as as a classic and, and one of the best. So coming soon from the Close of Our Podcast, um next week we look at Liam's favourite second Doctor story. Liam, what is that? 
Well, my favourite uh, Patrick Troughton story is another Cyberman story, and it's the invasion. Invasion. So yes, we have a fortnight of Patrick Troughton stories and a fortnight of, of Cyberman stories. Two very different stories. Oh yeah, yeah, they're, they're completely different. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, so d- if you're interested, tune in next week to uh, to hear why I think the invasion is the the best Patrick Troughton story. So for many other podcasts, head over to cloisterbellpodcast.com. You can find our social links on there. You can sign up for the weekly newsletter. And if you are on Apple Podcasts, please feel free to give us a rating and see what you, you will see what you think of us. And I think that's everything for today. Is that right, Liam? Yeah, yeah, but only if it's a good rating. If it's a bad one, yeah. then, you know, sort of. Five stars. <laughs> yeah, five stars, no, no less. <laughs> So, great. Well, have a good week. See you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.